For ye are yet carnal. For whereas there is among you envying and strife and divisions, are ye not carnal and walk as men? For while one saith, I am of Paul, and another, I am of Apollos, are ye not carnal? Who then is Paul? Who is Apollos? But ministers by whom ye believe, even as the Lord gave to every man. I have planted Apollos water, but God gave the increase. So then neither is he that planteth anything, neither he that watereth, but God that giveth the increase. Now he that planteth and he that watereth are one. Every man shall receive his own reward according to his own labor. For we are laborers together with God. Ye are God's husbandry. Ye are God's building. According to the grace of God which is given unto me as a wise master builder, I have laid the foundation. Another buildeth thereon. But let every man take heed how he buildeth thereupon. For other foundation can no man lay than that is laid which is Jesus Christ. Now if any man build upon this foundation gold, silver, precious stones, wood, hair, stubble, every man's work shall be made manifest. For the day shall declare it because it shall be revealed by fire. And the fire shall try every man's work of what sort it is. If, it, if any man's work abide which he hath built thereon, he shall receive a reward. If any man's work shall be burned, he shall suffer loss. But he himself shall be saved, yet so as by fire. Know ye not that ye are the temple of God, and that the Spirit of God dwelleth in you? If any man defile the temple of God, he shall, uh, him shall God destroy, for the temple of God is holy, which temple ye are. Let no man deceive himself. If any man among you seem to be wise in this world, let him become a fool that he may be wise. For the wisdom of this world is foolishness with God. For it is written, He taketh the wise in their own craftiness. And again, the Lord knoweth the thoughts of the wise. They are vain. Therefore, let no man glory in men for all things are yours. Whether Paul or Apollos or Cephas or the world or life or death or things present or things to come, all are yours. And ye are Christ and Christ is God. Brother Scott, would you pray for me tonight, brother? Our Father in heaven, Jesus, we come to God in the presence again tonight. God, we thank you for the word of God and the freedom thereof. I pray to for Brother Nathan tonight. God, that she stands and proclaim the word of God, that you give her strength, Lord, the ability, Lord, that you bring back to his mind that what you study. We pray the word for your morning, God, we call the morning. God, I pray to our hearts and our ears that we might be hearers of the new the word of God. Have your way tonight, Jesus. Amen. Amen. Thank you, brother. Here in just a minute from verse 5 on down. But I want to just look at a few things real quickly. Paul, he comes and he's addressing the, the church at Corinth. Now, if I could put it this way, I believe in a way when Paul came, and this kind of hit me as I was reading all the chapter number 4 today. I want you to look at verse 1, what Paul says. He said, I, brethren, could not speak unto you as unto spiritual, but as unto carnal, even as unto babes in Christ. Earlier in 1 Corinthians, around chapter number 1, he, he talks about two groups of people. He talks about the lost, and he talks about the saved. But then, here in chapter number 3, he's talking about two groups of saved people. There's one that's spiritual, and there's one that's carnal or fleshly. The spiritual man looks after the things of God and looks to the things of God and the leadership of God. And then the one who's fleshly and carnal might be looking for the fleshly things and holding on to the carnal things and the things of human nature. So I believe Paul is speaking to them in a way as his little children. Now, not that he's demeaning them and calling them a bunch of babies. But I read something today, Brother Jack, that spoke to my heart. In 1 Corinthians 4, 15, I believe that Paul speaks to them as their spiritual father. The Bible says in 1 Corinthians 4, 15, For though ye have ten thousand instructors in Christ, yet have ye not many fathers? For in Christ Jesus I have begotten you through the gospel. So I, I, I think Paul said, Here it is, we've established the church at Corinth. And as your pastor at one time, and spiritual leader at one time, I, I've been a channel that God can work through that you might be saved and grow. And said there, uh, said at, at first, when you were first saved and born again, you were like a little baby. And so I fed you milk. But there has to come a time that you get on the milk. And I desire to give you 
either has breast milk or, or formula, some kind of powder or something that you mix up. You're not just going to, uh, it, it would have been, it would have been very foolish and irresponsible for Don and I to have brought Ashley out of the Johnson City Medical Center and stopped by Wendy's and got her a big Dave Deluxe. <laughs> she, she, she could have. Now, the only thing I'd have done was say, Ashley, do you want that? When she didn't respond, I ate the same. <laughs> but so, anyways, that would have been crazy. So at first we come home and we, we give her the formula, but then the time comes that she's growing a little bit. And I, I can still remember that coffee table there in the Parsons at Unicoi. And actually had this little chair. Abby did too. They had this little chair. It had suction cups on it. And I put that on that uh, coffee table. And then I put the bank of Ashley or Abby in that, that little chair there. And I stripped a member that couldn't fall out. And then uh, you had a little oatmeal or a little rice that you could put some juice in or the formula and mix it up. And uh, we could take a little spoon and feed uh, uh, them that little rice or that oatmeal plus their formula. And then there comes a time when you can go and you can get that pureed stuff, blueberry buckle. I still like that myself. And every time the girls would have blueberry buckle, Daddy had a jar too, two, hey, man, or two or three. And uh, so I've always been guilty of eating the kids' food. And so anyways, uh, then, then they graduated to maybe having some mashed potatoes, you know, from KFC. Or you could take maybe some, uh, you know, you make a pot roast and those potatoes and the carrots and they cook down real good. Then maybe you take those carrots and potatoes and smash them down. You know where they could eat them. I remember the first time, Brother Floyd, that I gave my girls a strong uh, a drink of, of Coca-Cola, real Coca-Cola. You know, you go and how many has ever done this? You take a straw and put your fingertip on that straw, take just a little bit and uh, put it in their mouth and their eyeballs get that big. And, uh, you know, it's burnt the whole way down and their nostrils are burning. And then, and you really don't know how they're feeling at that point, but you're looking at them saying, ain't that wonderful? That's the best thing you've ever going to have. And then the next time that, you know, they, they come to that place where you get them their first happy meal from, from McDonald's. So, so here's Paul. Paul's saying, I, I want to I feed you some good stuff. I want to take you on a deeper level, but you're still babes in Christ. And now, I think one of the things about carnal people or carnal Christians, fleshly people, one of, one of the signs of a fleshly Christian means that they depend upon others and, and, and people a little too much. Let me make my point here. For instance, if all you ever do, now I don't misunderstand me, I want you to need me. Brother Jack wants you to need him. Uh, but if, if, when it comes to your spiritual growth, in the Word of God and in the things of God, if you just depend for, for what we preach behind this pulpit on Sunday morning and Sunday night and Wednesday night and what your Sunday school teacher gives you, if that's all you're depending on, you'll never grow in maturity in Christianity. You're always going to be a babe in Christ. And so Paul's saying, you're depending upon me too much. And I'm not, talk I'm not talking about in needing a pastor there. I'm talking about instruction from the Bible. And so Paul's saying, you're dependent upon me or you're dependent upon Apollos. He said, we're just ministers. And later on he talks about the foundation that they have built upon. And then he encourages everybody to build upon their foundation to grow as believers. So this is one, one sign that, one thing that Paul was addressing here. Saying there's got to be a time that is an immature Christian, a fleshly Christian, they always like to be in the center of things, the center of attention, or they like to know what's going on in everybody's life, and they like to, they like to, the, the Bible says, the envy and the strife, the fighting. You know, I know, I, I know people that just, they like it when a good fight breaks out, and that's sad. But now, as a mature Christian, when gossip and backbiting and fighting and chiding and all these things come about, a mature Christian isn't going to get in the middle of that. They're going to try to, to, to run from that and they're going to find a place where they can pray and, and see God's face and ask God to, and, and not try to defuse it themselves, 
situations. And then we come to uh, verse number uh, 4. He says, For while, while one saith, I am Paul, and another, I am of Apollos, are you not carnal? Now, I want to give you a few, about five lessons out of this chapter, real quickly. The first one is verse number 5. When then, or who then is Paul, and who is Apollos, but ministers? That means servant. All right, but ministers by whom you believe, even as the Lord gave to every man. The first thought that the Lord gave me is God chooses people. How many is glad that God chooses people? And I begin to think about that. There's been times that animals in the Word of God were more obedient to God than people were. You remember when the Lord wanted uh, Balaam to uh, go and do a certain task and say a certain thing? But he went his way and he didn't do what God wanted him to do. And so God used his donkey to prophesy and speak. That donkey was more faithful than Balaam was himself. Then I began to think about how Jonah, Jonah was supposed to go down and, uh, and to Nineveh and he was supposed to preach the gospel or, or, or preach to that lost uh, city. Uh, but he ran from God. But God had a servant by the name of a whale. And there that whale was where he needed to be, doing what he needed to do. And God said, well, I want you to swallow Jonah. And that whale swallowed Jonah and kept him there in his belly for three days and then spit him out on the dry ground. And guess what? Jonah went a-preaching. I think about how Jeremiah obeyed the Lord, but there was a time that he got discouraged, Sister Patsy. And as Jeremiah said, I'm not speaking his name no more.
deacons and I, we're all on the same team. Amen. There's no big me's and little me's and I's and whatever. Uh, we're, we're, we're all on the same team. God chose people to do His work. I'm sure there's a lot of other instruments in God's toolbox for God to use. But and listen, it is a blessing. It's an honor that the God of heaven would reach down and use somebody like you and me. In John 6, he used a little boy and five loaves of bread and two fish. In 2 Kings chapter number 5, he used a little handmaid to, to tell, uh, uh, to, uh, I can't think of the name all of a sudden, but the man that had the leprosy, uh, name it there in 2 Kings 5, God used a little uh, handmaid to tell him what he needed to do, that a prophet was going to tell him what he needed to do. Uh, God used Gideon when he was on the back side of the shed there working in and, and, and telling, uh, and working in the grave and the wheat and the barley. I mean, God, God calls people. And He don't call the highfalutin and the big and high and the mighty. Those that, he ain't going to call somebody that feels like they don't need God. He goes to the little ones who realize that we need God. And without God, we're nothing. I mean, he, I guess I think about Luke, who was a physician. But other than that, tax collector and fisherman, I mean, just little old. may say, well, preacher, I'm just a simple, a simple person. There might be someone here say, preacher, I didn't even graduate high school. That don't matter. If God calls you and He has a job for you to do, He'll give you everything you need to do that job. Amen. I believe that with all my heart. I'll never forget, I used to get tickled at Granddaddy Don's Granddaddy Preacher Bird. I remember when he was in his early 80s, I'd have to take him places. And one time he needed eye surgery and I had to pick him up and take him to get the eye surgery done and bring him home. But one day Sister Kathy, he needed to go to, uh, oh, let me think about it, Sister Christy. It's right there behind my home. He's Social Security's office. And uh, so anyways, I, I walked Granddaddy in that day. Dad had my arm, you know, through his arm making sure he didn't fall. And Uncle Mike, I took him in there and I we went up to that little window there and the lady had some questions. And she said, uh, uh, David Charles Berg. He said, Whoa, oh, everybody calls me by DC. Don't think that out that I'm David Charles. <laughs> and I said, I David Charles. Oh, don't tell nobody. You don't know anybody about the name. I said, okay. And, and, and I said, I like reminiscing a bit. And uh, Brother R.L., they, they said, now, you're, some these dates ain't matching up. He said, what do you mean? The, the date from when he got Social Security and he entered into well, the military and all that, it wasn't matching up. And I'll never forget, Sister Billy, he leaned up on that little, you know, little counter there. And, and it's the funniest thing. On. You know, have you ever went to see receptionists that's got them sliding last minutes? Well, he, he slid it to where it would just, here's the, here's the edge of that, here's the window. He slid it. I guess he's thinking that if it, he closes everything off other than what he said to that lady, I can't hear. <laughs> so he puts his face right there and he closes that window. And he said, honey, he said, let me tell you something. He said, my daddy went home to be with the Lord when I was just a little boy. And he said, somebody had to make a living. He said, I, I lied about my age. He said, I got a job work so long at the, the, the old John Sevier, I think it used to be a hotel if I remember right. He said, I worked at the John Sevier and I've done this. And he said, and a lot about the age to get into the army. And she, he said, he said, now God's forgiven me and you've got to. And so does the president. <laughs> <laughs> he been looking for me, Brother Jack. I was laying in the floor like <laughs> And she said, she said, Preacher Bird, there was a lot of people that had to do that. See, he, he, he now you think about it. You think about it. I know he's been my and Billy's pastor and Grady's and others through here. But I mean, when, when I, I'll never forget, we honored him 50 years of ministry when we was at Unicoi. And he'd done over 2,500 funerals and uh, I, I, 800 and some weddings and 600 and some revivals. And uh, uh, I don't even remember how many messages he preached. I mean, it was just amazing. And he never graduated high school. And he never had no big corporate jobs or anything. But he had the touch of God on his life. And, and, and I'm not saying that you've got to be a preacher. I'm just saying that you've got to be surrendered to God and submitting to God. And whatever He wants you to do, whatever service He... Listen, you, you can do something great for God. He's not going to call you and let you flop. No. No. He which hath begun a good work in you shall 
The second thought is verse number 6. I have planted a Paulus water, but God gave the increase. Now God uses people, but God gives the results. Let me, let me use a little illustration. I thought about this on my way back from Bristol. Let's say, let's say when Brother Jack worked for, uh, for uh, that, that place in Greenville, I can't think of the name. Greenville. Let's say that Brother, you, God called you to preach while he was working there, right? Now let's say that Brother Jack goes in one day, God burdens his heart with the co worker. This, this man or woman has never heard about the Lord, has never heard of the gospel, has, has never heard preaching, teaching, has never been saved. And Brother Jack just goes over and talks to them about the Lord. What he just done was planted the seed. Amen. Now, every day with Brother Jack that God puts it on his heart, every day that Brother Jack goes back, he's not replanting the seed. He's what? Now, now, there could be another co-worker that goes up to that man and witnesses to not replant the seed. What? Now, they might think they're planting the seed, but they're just what? Now, that man or that woman could go to a church, hear the preached word of God, and get saved. Now, listen, it wasn't the preacher that saved him. Brother Jack planted the seed. He went by and he watered. Other people went by and watered. Maybe family members went by and watered. Maybe he went to this church over here and heard a man preach and that preacher watered. And then he went to this church and heard that man of God preach and that man of God watered. And then he, and then he just runs into Sister Christy on the side of the road. And Christy gets burned about this stranger. And Christy just goes up and says, Hey, I, I found that to tell you about you. Oh, well, I, I, she's watered. And the day comes and it might have been Sister Christy that led that man to the Lord or that woman to the Lord. I'm telling you that some sow, some water, but it's always God that gives the increase. I think, now, I, I, I know that I'm a little slow. And I've seen my mama and papa all garden for years. But even myself, I knew, Sister Linda, that tiller I've got from you, I knew that if I went out there and I tilled up that ground, and I went to Mises or I went to Jones's Hardware or went to Evergreen or somewhere like that or somebody, Sister Myrtle gave me some tomato seed or something like that. Hey Amen. She, I mean, Brother Art, she grows, she grows tomatoes the size of basketballs. And so, uh, anyways, uh, well, almost as big. And so, anyways, I, I knew that when I go out there and I plant my cucumber seed and my squash seed and all that stuff, I'm not expecting to put it in the ground, go get the water hose and water it, and then the next morning come out and be disappointed because my beans ain't come up. I know better than that. I think sometimes we sow with the intent for the fruit to come up right then. It don't always work that way. But you know what? It gets discouraging. I, I, I still get discouraged. <laughs> come in Sunday morning, study it up. Sometimes, sometimes they get a lot of sleep, cause some nerve, and preach my heart out. And folks raise their hands. Brother Jack sees them. Brother Bill sees them. They raise their hand and need a salvation and not come. That's discouraging. I mean, there, there, there's been times that I've left and I thought, why, why even preach it here? But you know, that's just a tool of the devil. Yeah. The, hey, how many times have you witnessed to somebody? Maybe you prayed, maybe you're still praying for a, 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 a lost family member to get saved. Hey, just because they ain't got saved yet, don't get up. I think about Jeremiah. Sister Patsy, I studied about Jeremiah today about having myself a feed. Brother Buddy, I got to thinking and I got to researching this and study. Did you know out of all the years that Jeremiah preached, Sister Alice, no one ever got saved. No one under Jeremiah. That, that's the point. The Bible don't speak uh, of anybody getting saved there. But you know what? God used that little book that Jeremiah pinned down under the inspiration of God that later on encouraged Daniel and those during the day, the Prince of, the Prince of Persia, and you know what? It was a prophecy and foretelling and foreknowledge that God was going to bring His people out of captivity, out of bondage by what one man pinned down under the authority of God. God used that to encourage a man like Daniel. You'll never, you never know how God's using you. But you know what? It, 
get the cause of what any of us do. We need, yes, we need to sow and we need to water, but God gives the results. And then thirdly, God always should get the glory. Verse number 6. So then neither is he that planteth anything, or he that watereth, or, uh, excuse me, so then neither is he that planteth anything, neither is he that watereth, but God that giveth the increase. If there's anything good that ever happens in my life, if there's anything good that ever happens in your life, all oh, that God has done for us as a church, He gets all the glory. Amen. Now listen, He's used people. We, we, we got the debt paid off because He used people. People get saved. The church is growing. I don't know. Uh, uh, Sister Chris, don't get mad at me, but I'm going to brag on you a little bit. I don't know since Sister Chris has been coming here, if, if everybody came that she's invited, we'd have four people. Some co-workers, some... I'll never forget, one of them was one of Ashley's teachers. And I thought the whole time I was preaching, Sister Patsy, I thought, I know that lady from somewhere. And she came come out one Sunday morning, she said, now I know where Ashley gets a loud mouth. <laughs> <laughs> and I thought, I thought, who is this lady? And Ashley said, see one of my teachers. <laughs> she hadn't been back, but that's all. But, uh, no. <laughs> but I, what, what I'm saying... It don't hurt asking. We might have another family day. We might have a friend day. Just go to somebody and say, Hey, I'd like to invite you to church. What you've done is plan to see. They may never come. You might witness to someone. They may never get saved. But you've done your part. But whatever God does, He ought to get the glory. Number four, real quickly. Now he that planteth and he that watereth are one. You know what? They were on the same team. It wasn't about Paul. And it wasn't about Paulus. They're on the same team. You know what? I, I, God has blessed us with preachers. Brother Jack and Brother Bill and Brother Brady and Brother Scott and Brother Rodney and Preacher Tom. Brother Rodney, if I, I mean, I, I, Brother Sam Ferguson, he, he, he may be back here this year in a, little, a month or so. I don't know where he's going to choose to worship. But God's blessed us. But you know what? I'm glad, man, that there ain't no, no jealousy amongst us. I'm glad we're all the same team. All the deacons, if you put all the deacons, by the way, once a deacon, always a deacon, unless they do something to, to, to fail and ruin that. But all the deacons that we've got, same team. Trustees, same team. Uh, Sunday school teachers, same team. We've got a lot of youth workers. I'm glad there's no strife or nothing between. Hey, unity, we're on the, And guess what? It don't have to be the leadership of this church. I'm thankful for the unity and the fellowship and the love that we've got here amongst our brothers and sisters. And, the, and by the way, it's not just here. I'm telling you, we're on the same team with the other churches around. Right. If they're Bible believing, Bible preaching church, they may not view everything exactly like this, but they're on the same team as us. I'm not talking about false doctrines and cults and false religions or anything. I'm talking about, I'm talking about those of, if you want to call Baptistic, Protestant faith, they're our brothers and sisters. And then, you know, lately, one of the things that kind of has been getting on my nerves is on Facebook lately, there's all these different things that are popping up to preachers. And what it does is basically if you ain't a mega church, if you ain't running a thousand or more, they're calling the churches failures. And, uh, and, and one, one of them, somebody sent me one. I don't even know who the person was from Ohio. Somebody sent me one that says, the seven things you're doing that's killing your church. And I thought, well, I'm interested. This guy from Ohio knows me. Mm -hmm. And so when I read that, you know what? I mean, it, 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 good little thoughts. And, but it was, it, it was, it was just, just speaking that man's opinion. And it goes to everybody. But you know what? Just because there's a church, and, and, and there's a church next door that's got 25 people, but those 25 people are faithful to God. They're faithful in Sunday school, morning worship, Sunday night worship, Wednesday night worship. That man of God's preaching and studying and praying and visiting and encouraging people. And those people are trying to win the laws. They're doing everything. Church of 25 is just as great as the church.
together and they'd say, the, the rules committee is going to have to meet. And I was on the rules committee. I'd get called in and they'd say, Brother Nathan, we want you to write this down in the minutes and we're going to pass this in the rule book that there's not enough, there's, there's not, a preacher in our conference is not allowed to start another church within 15 miles of any other church. And I said, okay, I'll put that in there, but why do you want me to put that? Because, you know, I've been pastoring the same 30 people for 16 years, and if Brother so-and-so starts a church up the road, I might lose half of my people. And that's what they based it on. And I didn't put it in the meetings, and I didn't put it in the rules, because I thought that was goofy. If God puts up, but what, 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 I must, but that's just how I feel about it. If God moved on another man's heart to start a little church right there, and, and God began to bless and grow that thing, it's a God. But I've seen little people say, boy, I'm going to start a little church, and I'm going to, you know, they break off from one church and they start friendship or unity or peace. Amen. We start going to start a new church called Unity. Going to start. Did you, did you ever hear about the guy, Sister Alice? This is a true story. It's not, but I'm going to say it is. <laughs> I'm not behind the pulpit, Mother Dad. <laughs> did you ever hear about the guy that got stranded on an island? And all these years, he's stranded. 15, 20 years, finally they came to it. I mean, he's only going to live on this island. And boy, they seen him. They sent helicopters and airplane and news media and all these people. And one day, Sister Alicia, somebody's interviewing this guy. And he said, they said, oh, how'd you make it? He said, oh, I just lived off the land. Got coconuts and bananas and fruit. And went out and learned how to kill fish and spear them and all of that. And that's how I survived. Said, I built all these different little buildings. And they said, oh, what's that building out there? He said, oh, that's, that's my house. That's where I've lived this 15 years. They said, oh, what's this building over here on this side of the island? He said, oh, that's the church that I built. They said, what's this, what's this building on this side? I said, said that's where I used to go to church. <laughs> that man couldn't get along with himself. <laughs> I don't know if I told that right, but it sounded good. Now. <laughs> but yeah, that guy couldn't get along with himself. And there's some people that they can't get along, so they don't want to go to another church. By the way, everybody's looking for a church that's got perfect people. You'll never find a perfect church with perfect people. If there is a church that's got a perfect people, if you join it, you and so am I. Hey, we ain't perfect, none of us all. Amen. We're all on the same team. Amen. I don't know who's left. Some of the high people. That's a good point. Amen. All right. Let me give you this one. First off, God chooses people. Second, God brings results. Thirdly, God gets the credit. Fourth, He pushes teamwork. And then, fifth, God holds us. Accountable. I'm not going to spend a lot of time on this because I've got a message on will God receive our offerings. That's something to think about right there. But we are laborers together with God. You're God's husbandry. You're God's building. According to the grace of God which He gave unto me as a wise master builder, I have laid the foundation of the builder thereon, but let every man take heed how he built thereupon. For other foundation can no man lay then that is laid, which is Jesus Christ. Now if any man build upon this foundation gold, silver, precious stones, wood, hay, or stubble, every man's work shall be made manifest, for the day shall declare it, because it shall be revealed by fire, and the fire shall try every man's work of what sort it is. There's going to be a day that the church is raptured out of here. And we're going to stand before the judgment seat of Christ. If you stand in my opinion, if you stand before the judgment seat of Christ, you're saved and you're going to heaven. The judgment seat of Christ is not going to judge us according to our sins. It's going to judge us according to our service for the Lord. Now, I've had people disagree with me. Now, this is just my opinion and my thing. If God cannot, if, if He has forgiven our sin and cannot remember our sin, how is He going to judge us according to our sin? As far as the east is from the west, so far have they removed our transgressions. Into the sin forgiveness, never bring them up again. And, and Titus 1 2 says, God does not lie. If he says he can't remember your sin, then he's not going to judge you at the judgment seat of Christ for your sin. But now listen, Lord Rick, what we sow here. A person might have all, all kinds of sex with all kinds of people and all that and get AIDS. 
Well, they can be forgiven, but they still die on the things. So, we re person can, that guy that gunned down someone in Johnson City this past Saturday can be forgiven of that, but he's going to do time in prison. So, one day we're going to stand before the Lord. Now, there's the judgment seat of Christ, and then Revelation 19 tells us that there's the great white throne judgment, Revelation 22, the second death. The people that, that have never accepted Jesus will stand before God at the great white throne judgment. That, by the way, there is no second chances there. They'll be lost. And, and, and you know what? This is where the Catholics, Brother Floyd, they, they get this scripture and this is where they base purgatory. When you die, you're either going to heaven or hell. Mama can't light enough candles and pray enough prayers to pray you into hell. So there is no purgatory. Now, everything you've done for the Lord, if you've had the right motive and the right spirit and the right mind behind it, and you've done it whatever, 1 Corinthians 10, 31, uh, whether therefore you eat or drink or whatsoever you do, you know for the glory of God. It'll be like, like gold and silver and precious stone. When it's tried in the fire, it's going to last. And there might be, listen, some people, they, they, let me explain this. Some say, well, preacher, I'm doing the right things. Well, there's a lot of people doing the right things for the wrong reasons. And those are going to be the wood, the hay, the stubble that when it's tried by the fire, it's going to go up like stubble. It's going to be put. It's going to be nothing to die. Now, I was preaching one time in a youth meeting, Brother Lee, and I, I, I was kind of along these lines, and a young person came up and said, well, preacher, said, uh, said if, if that judge, judging is basing on my service, said, I'm saved, right? I said, yeah, you're saved. said, I'm still going to heaven. I said, yeah, you're going to heaven. They said, well, I don't care if I get rewards or not. And that bothered me. Later on, when all the other young people were away from him, I got him by myself, being another uh, youth leader. And I said, so I want to explain something. I said, the Bible tells us that one of these days, four and twenty elders are going to bow down at the foot of Jesus. And they're going to cast their crowns at his feet. I said, I want to have something to cast. Now, we're probably never going to get a martyr's crown. There's five crowns that we'll get. We'll probably never get the martyr's crown unless we die as a martyr. If you've never led anyone to the Lord, you'll not get a soul winner's crown. You get, the, you get the crown of life from where you've been saved, but if you've won somebody to the Lord, the soul winner's crown, that's a whole other message. I ain't got time. But you know what? All, all, all the rewards that you get, it's not because of what we've done. It's because God gave the increase. I don't want to get up there and have all kinds of rewards to say, look at me. And we're not going to, Sister Sandy, we're not going to parade around heaven and say, boy, look, look at me, look what I've done. We're going to cast everything at Jesus' feet and say, look what He's done. Right. Look what He's done. Amen. I want to invest in other people's lives. There's, there's a field out there that we need to invest in. There's a foundation that we need to be building on. Amen. There's a family of God that we need to encourage and be a blessing to and give hope to. You never know. You may be the channel that God uses to bring hope into somebody's life. Love into somebody's life. Brother Bill, I know he don't want no glory or nothing like that. I just say, Brother Glory has been a Brother Bill has been a channel for the Lord of God this week. He's been there at the VA and Don Silvery and other places giving the car. He's been a channel that has brought love and happiness and hope in other people's lives. You never know wherever you're at. God, God may put we think, boy, well, we're just here for a reason. God, God's put us, or we're just here by accident. Or what God has put us and place, placed us in places with purpose. Amen. Because He's got a job for us to do. I really believe that. Let's be, let's be wise investors. Amen. Let's stand to our feet this evening and be good listeners. Be good listeners. Amen. I don't know when we're going to get through 1 Corinthians, but I'm having myself a time in it. Amen. Hopefully, hopefully you're enjoying it as well. Brother Roger, I love you, my friend. Would you dismiss us in prayer? Oh, great family.